ladies and gentlemen, let me see a show of hands for how many people have ordered pie today. Hmm, nobody's ordered pie. This is 3.14 day. Welcome to uh, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Today we have an effort to answer a burning question. All right, I had to say that. I had to, I had to. I, I may never be forgiven, but I had to. We have Matt Davis from Washington County HHS. And today he's going to teach us about the wood smoke issues. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Davis. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. I really, really appreciate the opportunity. First, I want to apologize. I'm in the middle of a nasty cold, so um, excuse me if I have to cough or take a sip of water. Um, and hopefully I have enough steam to get through the next hour. So I was actually here almost 12 months ago to the day talking about the same topic. Um, it was only my second week on, on in this position, uh, which was great because it gave me an opportunity to early on kind of think about how we wanted to present this issue to the public. And you all had um, some really interesting and challenging questions for us, and it, it really informed the work. Um, about a year ago, you know, we didn't, we knew we had an issue with PM 2.5 pollution. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and we knew that it was largely a wood smoke issue. But other than that, we were very early in terms of our, our planning about what we were going to do about it. Um, and uh, kind of reflecting on the drive over, I, I feel pretty pleased with the progress we've made in, in just 12 months. And um, I hope you all are kind of, we'll, we'll see how you feel about it. Um, but I think it is really neat to have the opportunity to, to talk to the group, you know, just one year after we've kind of launched into this work. And it's a great, opportunity to have some accountability on us to, to show progress. So with that, I'll, I'll launch into the presentation. Um, you know, one of the key messages that we've spent a lot of time talking about over the last year and I'll talk about today is that, you know, despite a, uh, a kind of green ethos where we feel proud about here in the Northwest, Washington County really um, struggles with air quality issues, particularly in the winter time. Um, we've seen, you know, many, many years uh, kind of unhealthy levels of certain types of pollution in the winter. Um, and that, that, that's kind of persisted. Um, we also know through kind of a variety of different um, data that the issue is largely driven by wood smoke, which is a really challenging thing to come to terms with. Um, people burn wood for a really good reason, to stay warm in the winter. Um, and it becomes really complicated to try to um, work through this issue of you know, how do you reduce this type of pollution while keeping people warm in the winter. And that's really been, I would say, our, our two guiding principles or our guiding goals over the last 12 months is, you know, how can we improve the air in Washington County while keeping families warm in the winter? And I hope you'll see that kind of reflected in the strategies that we've been working on. So I want to start by just highlighting a couple graphs. Um, you might not be able to see them too well, but I'll point out really what, what's kind of important in the graph. So this graph shows um, levels of particulate matter, um, which is the, the type of pollution that wood smoke is, is primarily responsible for um, contributing to. So this, this shows levels of that type of pollution throughout the year. So going left to right is January to December throughout the calendar year. And you'll see the highest, the highest levels occur on either side of the graph, meaning kind of January, February, and then October through December. Um, and this is, this is because of uh, kind of two main reasons. One, that's when we do most of our wood burning. A lot of people don't fire up the wood stove in August and July. Um, we just don't need it. Um, but also, weather plays a really important uh, role in this problem, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's kind of a compounding effect. That's when we burn the wood, but that's also where we have um, weather challenges that are really outside of our control. Um, 
the orange line, which is kind of in the, in the middle of the graph, that's the threshold for levels that are uh, un uh, levels of that type of pollution that's unhealthy for sensitive groups. Sensitive groups meaning um, children, older adults, people who have uh, existing respiratory conditions like asthma or COPD. So y you can see um, it's not, it it's rare, but it's not unheard of to kind of get into that uh, level here in Washington County. So the next chart is really busy, <laughs> and I apologize for that, but again, I would focus on the red line that goes across the whole screen. Um, we roll our, our particulate pollution values uh, up into one value for the year, and that has to do with the, the way the Federal Clean Air Act is written. And that red dashed line that, that kind of was up at the top in the early 2000s and went down here um, at about 2007, that's the federal standard. And you'll see that um, certain years, 2011, 2013, our yearly value is, uh, is above that standard. And that's really concerning for a number of reasons. The, the first is the standard is health-based. It's based in epidemiology. So when we are having values that high, that means there's public health impacts being experienced by our community. Um, and then also there's a regulatory component. You, you shouldn't be exceeding that level and there are consequences when you do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But you know, you'll see that the, the last, I don't know, six years or so are defined by this jumping you know, up and down. And, and I, I can't tell you exactly why that is. You know, I, I think we're experiencing a lot of variability in terms of our winter weather. This year we had a pretty mild winter uh, overall. Um, certainly last year, I, I'm not sure we had a winter. Um, it, you know, we, it, it rained and it got into the 40s, but a really mild year. And again, that's, that's an important factor. Um, on, on the flip side, 2013, when we had our worst year, we had a really cold, um, cold winter that year and, and long, long cold winter. So now I want to zoom in from the community scale down to a, uh, a microscopic scale, actually. So what you see on the slide here is an a illustration of a piece of hair, uh, kind of a cross cut of a piece of hair. And a, a piece of our hair is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter, pretty small. But the, the type of pollution we're talking about is two and a half microns in diameter. So um, almost a, a 40th of the size of the, the thickness of your piece of hair. So incredibly small particles um, that's being produced by burning wood. Um, you can't see the particles. You can see them when they accumulate, and I'll show some pictures, but just with your human eye, if there was one floating by, you know, we couldn't see it. That, that size becomes really important from a physiological standpoint. Um, our lungs, our upper respiratory system, uh, it, is fairly good at sorting out larger particles, things like dust and pollen and mold. Those are all about 10 microns in diameter. When you get down to two and a half, that's when our, our body fails us. Um, and we breathe those particles very deep into our lungs. Um, and depending on how, just how small they are, they can pass into our bloodstream. And that becomes a problem because those particles are carrying with them a variety of um, chemicals and metals and um, carcinogens. And, uh, and when you are breathing these particles over your lifetime, even at low ambient levels, um, you're, you, we're increasing our risks to really long-term conditions like lung cancer. Um, and on the short term, it, it can aggravate asthma or uh, you know, respiratory conditions. So it, it has um, very real health consequences. So again, kind of zooming back out to the community level, one of the things we know is wood smoke impacts some communities more than, other, more than others. This is a map that shows um, levels of wood smoke pollution. That's the red scale. So the darker the red is there's higher levels of wood smoke pollution there. Um, it's also a layered map. So there, there's a blue scale that's showing where um, communities of color live. And when you kind of layer these maps and do an analysis, you can see that uh, where wood smoke is highest is the, is the same areas where we have uh, higher density of communities of color. 
Um, and that's a problem in the public health world because we also know that communities of color have a higher burden of those same diseases I talked about. So if you look at levels of asthma, the rate of asthma is higher in communities of color than, than their white counterparts. If you control for everything else like um, age and income and um, all those types of uh, factors. And, and again, just purely from a geographic standpoint, it's concerning from the pub, kind of for public health officials to see that we have these hot spots where there's a lot of wood smoke. Um, and this comes from data that looks at both emissions, so where the smoke is coming from, but also meteorological factors and, and geography, so where the smoke tends to get stuck and kind of settle. So again, I'm just walking you through some background to kind of articulate the issue, which I did a lot of last year, and I'm, I'm happy that this year I can talk more about solutions. So this is a picture last year um, on a winter day. This is um, what we would consider uh, uh, just on the cusp of kind of dangerous levels of particulate pollution if we looked at the monitor that day. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how the picture looks for you, but the the field of visibility really diminishes within 100 yards. And this is just in downtown Hillsborough. Again, on a winter day, this isn't wildfire smoke or, or something like that. Um, it's also not a foggy day. So that's, that's particle, you know, wood smoke pollution. Um, and again, this is kind of so you can visually see at, at the at the, the point at which we become concerned of kind of an inundation of particle pollution. Here's another image on the same day. This is at the Hare Field Sports Complex in, in close to downtown Hillsboro. This is actually where one of our air quality monitors is situated. Um, and it, it's actually managed by the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. But we, and actually you, can have a, a live feed to the data so you can see what the level is doing. Um, it's kind of interesting, the monitors are typically situated at places like schools or um, uh, athletic facilities where there's fields because it gives us a really good sense of what the levels of pollution are in that neighborhood without it being um, influenced by a particular house. So if you have the monitor right next to a house and, and they burn a lot, then you're, you know, you're influencing that monitor. If you situate it away, you're getting a better read. Um, the real point of this picture, though, is I'm not sure if you can tell, but you, you'll see kind of sheets of smoke out there. This is that same winter day. And this is a really good visualization of a cold air inversion, which we get a lot of in the county. Um, cold air inversions occur when kind of a layer of warm air traps the cold, the, the cold air near the Earth's surface. Sometimes it's just hours. I mean, we have them every night throughout the winter. The problem is the ones that last days. And the air isn't moving, and neither is all of the um, stuff we put into the air, wood smoke in particular, because we, only, we emit it at only you know, 25 feet up or something like that. And so you can start to see the wood smoke um, accumulate and, and basically just stay right at, at the roof line. Um, and I really can't stress the kind of the influence of these inversions enough. They coincide basically directly with our highest, our highest levels of pollution. So if we're getting good wind mixing or a rainstorm comes through, that acts as kind of a natural filter. It cleans our air. It's responsible for us having pretty good air quality most of the year. Um, but again, those four or five times a winter when we have a multi-day inversion, that, that's exactly when we see really unhealthy levels of particle pollution. Um, and this became important for us thinking through how we address the problem in kind of a responsible way. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I also mentioned that there's um, kind of regulatory consequences for particle pollution. Briefly, the way this works is the, the federal government through the um, Clean Air Act sets what are called ambient air quality standards for a couple of or six different air pollutants, um, PM 2.5, these small particles being one of them. And the rule says, you know, you as a community um, sh shall not exceed this, this standard. You sh your community should not be breathing particle pollution at, above this standard. 
And when you do, there, um, there's a kind of a, a risk of being labeled non-attainment. That means you're, you're violating the standard. And that has a whole host of kind of direct and indirect consequences. I think most relevant to the wood smoke issue is it, it oftentimes means local, local governments have to institute really um, strict kind of utilitarian policies reducing wood smoke. And that was something we really wanted to avoid. We wanted to create kind of a Washington County solution that was responsive to our realities and not have to just have a, a, a blanket policy that we were going to be required to put in place. Um, I also just highlighted some communities in Oregon that are in non-attainment right now. This is not a new issue. Commu uh, communities like Oak Ridge, which is um, just east of Eugene, they've been struggling with this for um, literally decades. Um, and when you talk to community leaders in Oak Ridge, um, it, it's a really tough place to be in. It, it limits economic development. They're stuck with these kind of harsh policies. Um, it, and they just have to suffer the health consequences of this um, really extremely high levels of uh, particle pollution. So now I want to kind of pivot into what we're doing about it. That was largely a repeat of what I gave you all last year. Um, and I, I just want to bring you up to speed with what we've been doing over the last 12 months. I mentioned our two kind of guiding goals, reduce particle pollution while keeping families warm. Um, we've, we've kind of gone about meeting those goals uh, through a strong partnership with the city of Hillsboro. So I work for Washington County Public Health. Um, and, and again, we've been partnering with the city of Hillsboro. We also convened an advisory team uh, with technical experts and community leaders. Your own Spencer Ehrman sat on the advisory team. Um, and I was really pleased with that effort. We had um, really kind of diverse set of perspectives there to advise the county and the city on how to, how to design kind of responsive and responsible approaches to the issue. And also as an advisory team, I think we, uh, there were several kind of realities that uh, helped guide our work. And I want to walk you through those because they're really important. The first is that, you know, what you're burning in makes a huge difference. So this graph shows relative emissions of, of particle pollution based on uh, the heat that it, you know, relative to the heat that it produces. So the far left is a fireplace very inefficient at, at giving off heat, um, produces a ton of particle pollution. As you walk through the graph, you'll see that the next one is an uncertified wood stove. These are wood stoves that are kind of pre-late um, pre 1980s, I guess. Um, and they also uh, produce a lot, of, a lot of particle pollution. The next is a certified wood stove. So these wood stoves were manufactured under um, guidelines by the state of Oregon and EPA to, to burn cleaner, basically. So they're just designed uh, to, to burn more efficiently. So it results in better combustion and less particle pollution. Um, then you see pellet stoves and then oil furnaces and natural gas, which are almost complete combustion. So you see very little particle pollution. Again, this is, this is important because you know what, what this means is you know, we're not, we, we don't need to get everyone to stop burning. That's not, a, that's not an appropriate um, strategy for this issue. What we need to target are those folks who are relying on those old appliances um, because they, they're producing a lot of emissions. So the next is, is probably the most uh, kind of critical illustration of um, how we should address this problem. So this data comes from a metro-wide survey done by Portland State University about wood burning. On the left, you see a pie chart. Um, those are answers to the question, uh, you, do you burn wood for heat? So you see the, a big majority of folks, 67%, they don't do any wood burning. Um, so again, this is a kind of a, a certain part of the population that's relying on wood burning. The blue uh, piece of the pie are those folks who burn wood for heat, but they do it as their secondary heat source. So they supplement something else with wood heat, probably you know, maybe a natural gas furnace or electric baseboards. Electric heat can be really expensive. 
Um, so on the coldest days, people will supplement that with wood heat as a kind of a financial alternative. Um, and then the small red piece are, is the, it's about 5% of the population that relies primarily on wood burning. So that is their heat source. They're burning wood day in, day out. If you slide to the, um, to the right, um, you see that's translated to how much of the particle pollution is coming from those two groups. And you see that 5% of the population, those folks that rely exclusively on wood heat, account for over half of the particle pollution. And that makes sense, right? They're burning day in, day out for you know three to four months of winter. But the other thing that um, is probably even more important is that those secondary burners, those folks that are supplementing it, their heat with wood, account for the other half. Um, and you know, one thing that we heard from the advisory team and, and other communities is you can't treat those two pieces of the pie the same. They're burning wood for different reasons, and you need to kind of support um, support them. You know, burning less or burning differently or something in a in a different way. There's different solutions for those two groups. Um, this is another map that we had TEQ generate for us. Um, the darker the color, the higher the wood burning. And this takes data from that phone survey I mentioned and then models it up based on the community in Washington County. So it looks at, it, it takes the, the results from the survey about who burns wood and how much they burn and it applies it to the census tracts throughout Washington County. So it's a modeling exercise. Um, it, it's interesting because it generally follows the same pattern of that red map I showed you of where, where most of the pollution exists. And again, this is, you, you take it for what it is, I think it's useful data to kind of target our efforts. It doesn't mean that someone in a white area isn't burning a ton of wood in an uncertified stove or that there's people who aren't burning in a, in a blue tract. It's a, just generalizations. Just a couple more data points. Sorry, we're really data driven in public health, so it's important for us to kind of show that we're not making stuff up. Um, so, this again is from that same phone survey, and it gets at why do people burn wood, which is a really interesting question. And I think a lot of communities, when they're facing this issue, they operate on a lot of um, assumptions about why people burn or don't burn wood. So it's really valuable to have this statistically significant survey to, to look at why people in this community burn wood. And you can see that um, there's, a, there's a cultural element to this. I mean, almost over 50% of people burn it because they enjoy burning wood or they enjoy wood heat. They enjoy the, the type of heat that wood burning produces. Um, so that's kind of irrespective of maybe they uh, rely on wood because it's cheaper or something like that. It, it's people enjoy it, and that's something else I think we have to remember and um, appreciate, I guess, when we're trying to develop solutions. Um, and you can kind of see the other slivers. I'm not sure what the other is, if, they, if other was an option or if they pooled all of the other responses and, and labeled it other. It's kind of been on a to-do list for a while to figure that out. But again, um, really important kind of valuable data. So the next two are questions that we asked Washington County residents uh, the, over the last summer. And we did this through um, electronic surveying uh, and uh, just face-to-face -face, uh, paper surveys at the, sorry, at the county fair, at farmer's markets, um, a variety of community events. We had about 500 folks complete the survey. Um, it had a bunch of other questions about um, you know, why you burn wood, where you live, that kind of stuff. But the two key policy questions were, do you support restrictions on burning of yard debris? I talked a lot about this last year. It it's also can be an issue in some parts of the county where people are burning a lot of yard debris as a method of disposal. And you can see about 57% were supportive with 33% saying no and that kind of a 10% wanting more information. The second question I abbreviated, it, it actually read something like, do you support restrictions on wood stove and fireplace use uh, during periods of poor air quality? And again, uh, a little less support, but um, uh, still kind of a 
moderate amount of folks being supportive of some type of restriction being put in place on burning. Um, and this was valuable, these two questions. I think what was probably more valuable was the open-ended question, which was just what, what should we consider when working on this issue? And you know, those answers really informed how we shaped our policy and um, outreach strategies because people had really, uh, it's their life, so they had really good input on what it would mean for them to have a, you know, if there were restrictions in place or how restrictions could be designed so they could still be warm in the winter. So taking all of that data that I've walked through, um, community surveys, technical experts, community leaders, um, we also did a, um, informational interviews with about seven local governments around the Pacific Northwest who've had this same issue of elevated particle pollution and designed um, kind of our, our three-point plan. Um, my, my director calls it the three legs of the wood smoke stool. Um, again, because, you, you know, one thing we learned is you really need all three of these for it to work. You can't, can't pick one or two of them. Um, so what you'll see is the, the three kind of legs are curtailing or limiting wood smoke on those bad air days. And those, by those bad air days, I, I really mean those inversion episodes. So we can see those cold air inversions coming a couple days out, so we know the pollution is going to be bad. So it's about targeting those um, events each winter. The second one is extensive community education and outreach, extensive and continual um, kind of throughout the years. And then the third is uh, supporting people replace, re to replace their older wood stoves. So I mentioned the older appliances br uh, produce a lot more particle pollution. It's also not cheap to get a new wood stove. Um, and if you want people to make that transition, you really have to provide some incentives or, or kind of help them move that direction. So I'm going to go into a little more detail about each uh, three of these. So the first is our local, our local policy, our rules that we've adopted. This is now in place in unincorporated Washington County, the city of Hillsborough, and the city of Cornelius. Um, and basically it's a color-coded advisory system just for the winter months, so November through uh, February. Um, and it's a, it's a rating of the air quality um, based on real levels of particle pollution. Um, yellow meaning we're, we're kind of getting into dangerous levels and we're asking people uh, if you can burn less or don't burn. Red meaning um, we are experiencing unhealthy levels of particle pollution and you can't use your fireplace or wood stove. Except, and this is where all of that uh, kind of community input really shows, we've designed a community and technical knowledge. We've included a number of exemptions which people kind of um, self-identify uh, self us. They don't have to file paperwork with the county or anything. So pellet stoves are exempt because they're incredibly clean burning. It's a uniform fuel, a uniform fuel to air ratio, so you, you get good complete combustion. Um, the second is if wood burning is your sole source of heat. So uh, obviously we're not going to ask someone to go cold at night just because they rely on wood heat. So you know, they're exempt from the rule. Excuse me. Um, the third is uh, income-based exemption, because one thing we heard is, you know, I may have another type of heat, electric baseboard, for example, but I can't afford to use it. So I use wood um, because it's the only affordable option. Um, so again, we have uh, income eligibility for to, to be exempt from the policy. And then a couple other that, that have to do with um, uh, kind of emergencies and things like that. And again, t to me, this highlights how the policy really impacts those secondary burners, people who might have other options. Um, the enforcement's complaint driven, it's kind of an opportunity to educate, it's not an exercise in writing tickets. Um, and this year we didn't, uh, we only issued one yellow day because we had a, a mild winter, so we, we didn't issue any of the, the red days. Uh, I'm sorry, the slide. <laughs> so the second strategy was community <laughs> education. Um, and I'll just, <clears throat> this, is, this is really important and kind of our key messages have been wood burning contributes to poor air quality, um, burning's not allowed anymore on red days unless you qualify as exempt. 
um, and sign up for what are called Red Day Alerts at publicalerts.org, which is a messaging system that will send you a phone call or a text message or an email if we issue a Red Day advisory. And we've done that community education through a variety of means. Um, th there's been quite a bit of just earned media um, attention to this issue over the last 18 months. That's been really effective at uh, reaching you know, a, lot of, a lot of folks. Uh, the Boy Scouts of America have been uh, a pretty critical partner. They've now, over two winter seasons, uh, gone to over, to pr probably about 20,000 uh, doors and delivered information about, educational information about air quality and how to burn cleaner. Um, we work through a variety of partners that you see on the screen to educate their constituencies. One of them really important is the Department of Forestry, which issues wood cutting permits in Forest Grove. Um, they have now been giving out educational material with every wood cutting permit on how you fully season your wood so it burns clean and produces less of that particle emission. And then um, our final strategy, which is a wood stove replacement program, we're in the very early days of this, but I, we, I can now say with certainty that we'll have a program starting this summer that will include a variety of grants and rebates for folks who switch out an older, more polluting wood stove for something cleaner. So for lower income households, we'll be covering the, the switch out at full cost. We'll be paying for it completely. Um, and for folks who don't meet those income qualifications, we'll have a sliding scale based on their income for a rebate to help eat away at those costs. And those rebates will be um, in addition to a variety of incentives that already exist through utility providers and um, tax credits to kind of eat away at that cost of uh, converting to a newer, cleaner heat source. The program goal is 700 stoves in five years, which the DEQ has shown us through uh, kind of modeling efforts that that's what we really need to get at to, to really um, reduce those levels um, with some certainty. So uh, even if the weather is, we have a lot of inversions, if we replace so many stoves, we're going to bring that level down over the years. And then finally, briefly, just um, what you can, <clears throat> what can, what can you do? And this has been an important message to everyone we talk to, and that's really three things. Um, we're asking people, even if you don't live in uh, Hillsborough or unincorporated Washington County or Cornelius, the air quality doesn't uh, stop at those jurisdictional boundaries. We're in one airshed, um, and if you can, please, please don't burn or burn less on those red days. Um, and you can find out if it's a red day by signing up at publicalerts.org, or we update it daily on our county website and through a uh, phone line that you can call into. And then if you have to burn, to please uh, only burn dry, fully seasoned wood. Um, and that's probably, uh, aside from a new appliance, that's the most important thing we can do to reduce particle pollution is stick to that really well-seasoned uh, dry wood. So that's what I've got. Um, I'll, I think I turn it over to, to Rob, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions. Thank you very much. And we could hardly even hear the struggle with your voice. Your words were so important, and it is important. I see people lining up, so I will get out of the way, and we'll go with questions. I'll talk with you later. Thanks, Matt. new county employee. If possible, could you discuss the new county employee application process and the new county employee interview process and supervisors and management within county employees? Thank you. Um, sure, I can speak to what I know. I'm not totally involved in hiring, but um, we it's a public service process where you uh, all jobs are competitive to all applicants, and you complete a written application, generally followed up by a oral, it's called an oral exam and interview, um, and then proceed to the, the hiring manager makes the decision. Does that answer your question? Uh, do you have any suggestions on how it could be better? Oh, um, I didn't come prepared to, to kind of think about that, but I'm, I'm happy to give you my card and follow up. Hi, my name is Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. 
I was out walking yesterday and I could smell the wood smoke in the air. Does that mean that, uh, you know, that it's not filtered or something or not? Yeah, so, um, so wood smoke, it, one of the things people like about it actually is that smell that you probably smelled walking around. Um, and when, when you, you're, you're smelling the particle pollution essentially okay. and whether it's coming from a, um, a certified device or just an open fireplace is really hard to tell. The, you know, the other thing that we're kind of through the winter winter months now, or we, what we call the winter season for this for purposes of wood smoke, um, and we haven't had really, we tend to not see really high levels after March 1st, but one of the things that happens starting March 1st is agricultural and backyard burning in some communities resumes, um, and you tend to see um, a lot of outdoor burning in the month of March because people have been waiting all winter for that to that to be allowable again. So uh, I mean, I've noticed, personally noticed, kind of smoke plumes and can smell them. I'm not sure where you live or anything like that, but you know, if if you're smelling the w the smoke, that's that's the particle pollution that I've been talking about. The, the only uh, last thing I was going to ask was the. Uh, uh, on, on bad pollution days especially, is it pay off to stay indoors? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, and it, ha it, it depends a lot on your, the particular building envelope that you happen to be in. So, um, you know, newer construction homes that are well insulated and have, you know, kind of more modern HVAC systems, that can make a difference. If it's more drafty, it, it might not matter as much. It also depends if you have a neighbor, right, in your immediate vicinity that is producing a lot of smoke. Um, it pays off, uh, uh, the other thing I forgot to mention, this is somewhat related, is the people who experience the health impacts the most are the folks who are relying on burning. There's been quite a bit of study of indoor air quality on homes that rely on wood heat, and the levels of particle pollution in the home are um, really, really dangerous. Uh, and, and people are, and it, um, it's unfortunate because people need, a lot of people rely on wood to heat their home and they're um, experiencing this kind of unfortunate byproduct. Um, the only thing I'd add is if, if you have an existing respiratory condition or, or you feel like you might be sensitive to the effects of wood pollution, certainly limiting um, rigorous outdoor activity on those days can make a big difference. So, you know, biking, running, exercising, where you're having a lot of, um, a lot of air intake, that, that can be an important um, factor. John Blackman, forum member. Do you, uh, the cost of natural gas seems to be going down rather than up. Do you have any figures on the cost of natural gas versus the cost of purchasing uh, wood for fire and for heating purposes? Yeah, so I can't give you any numbers off the tips of my finger, but I can send them to you because the Department of Energy updates them on an annual basis. Um, but I, um, it, it becomes complicated because people get, w you have to get natural gas from the natural gas company. You're, you're somewhat limited in where you can get that gas from. You're not limited in where you can get cordwood from. And people get it um, from a variety of sources from buying a cord of fully seasoned wood from a, some type of dealer to chopping it down themselves. I said purchasing. Uh, purchasing. So even then, uh, it's not particularly, you know, uh, well regulated. So the price variability, even in Hillsborough, of getting a cord of wood is kind of all over the map. And then in terms of it, relating it to how much heat it's putting off, that again depends on your particular appliance and how, it, how well it heats your home. Um, I will say in talking to the kind of hearth patio, um, hearth patio Barbecue Association, these are the retailers that sell wood stoves, they've noticed, they notice a marked difference when in their wood stove sales when natural gas prices drop. So they see a lot of people going to natural gas furnaces, stoves and inserts when the price falls because it becomes a really competitive um, and easy option for home heating. When natural gas goes way up, like um, it did, that, that's actually what spurred a, a huge growth in the wood stove industry in the late 70s was um, high gas prices and people migrating to this alternative where they could get fuel themselves or you know buy it locally or something like that. 
Yeah, um, I can give you the, the, I can send you the figures. I don't have them at the tips of my finger. Um, I, I do know that um, the chart last year, natural gas was cheaper than, it was cheaper than heating your home with, with wood. And that used a, kind of an average figure for the cost of wood. Rob Solomon, forum member. In looking at your charts, and I'm not very good at interpreting them, you were very good at sharing, there were some 57% of people that don't burn wood. And then the numbers of people that are interested in doing something different to help that were somewhere in the mid-50s. So my logic, rightly or wrongly, asks the ob what I think is the obvious question. Are all the people that don't burn wood the ones that want to do something about wood smoke? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we, uh, in our community survey, which is different than the one that generated that pie chart, we asked people, do you, do you burn wood? Um, and then asked everyone that question, do you support restrictions? And the ratio stayed about the same, whether you were talking to people who burned wood or did not burn wood. Um, so it, in our you know, much smaller scale survey, it didn't seem to matter much, but I'm, I'm not confident in saying that's not the case for the that larger metro area survey that I referenced. Yeah. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. Thank you for being here today. I have a question about your community relations program, and I'm wondering, have you ever considered or have you uh, uh, communicated with homeowner associations and perhaps with the people that operate these large rental complexes regarding this issue? Uh, homeowner associations are kind of the footprint around here for, I think, an awful lot of our housing, and uh, they have a, an interest in having healthy communities, and perhaps uh, by communicating with those boards, uh, there could be uh, uh, more information out, just asking about it. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great suggestion. We, ha uh, To my knowledge, n neither the county or the city of Hillsborough have communicated through those groups yet, so we've dealt with the CPOs and the neighborhood um, City of Beaverton Neighborhood Advisory Committees, which I understand are different. So that's a great suggestion and something on the, to put on the 2016 uh, work plan. John Blackman, former member again. Uh, the cost of air um, measuring, monitoring, I understand is quite high. Uh, do you feel, number one, that you have a really adequate number of air monitoring locations? And number two, would it not be better to locate those stations completely at random rather than locating them in selective positions? Yeah, another great question. So uh, like I mentioned, the Department of Environmental Quality manages all of the air quality stations. Um, you know, we have two in the county. I feel that's adequate enough to show that we have high levels. Um, I wish we had more because I think we're missing, we're relying on modeling to to help direct us to kind of hot spots. And of course, actually monitoring those hot spots would be more ideal. Um, I will say that uh, the, we're somewhat tied in terms, of, our hands are tied in terms of where we situate the monitors. Um, there's a lot of federal guidance about where you have to put those and a lot of studying that goes into it. Um, so uh, I don't see them moving anytime soon, I guess. Um, but yes, I wish we had I wish we had more monitoring. Finally get here. Harry Bodine, forum member. Um, my wife and I live in a 57-year-old a house in Cedar Hills. We have, uh, I think we were the last people on the cul-de-sac to have a fireplace that we use. And what we're burning these days are these fire logs, which come wrapped in this wrapper saying how environmentally environmentally good they are. And so we enjoy one log a night when we do it. And uh, just your comments on these logs, if you would. Yeah, um, I do the same thing, actually. <laughs> um, so there, in terms of particle pollution, which we're talking about today, um, very, very clean burning. Uh, again, they're designed for almost complete combustion. So again, you don't see a lot of that particle pollution with them. In terms of what else is in the emissions, that's a question that there's a little more uncertainty about because it depends on how they're binding the wood fiber, um, what kind of glues and waxes and things like that they're using. Um, there's, uh, there's 
kind of now a product on the market that's actually made here in Oregon by two different companies um, that's, that is held together purely by compression, so there's no glue or wax or anything like that, and they don't, they don't come wrapped, they come in bundles of six or something like that. Um, anyway, that's a kind of another option. There are also emit uh, close to no particle pollution, but they, they don't come with those other, uh, I don't know, uh, things that are in them that, that we're not sure what they are, so. Thank you. Chris Leslie, forum member. Uh, do you have any statistics on how many uh, red days you have, yellow days, or green days? Yeah, that's a great question. So this last winter season was the first one since we adopted the, the rules which put into place this color-coded advisory. So this last winter, there was um, we issued one yellow advisory. Um, we opted to not, it, there was one day when we could have, the levels were that high, but we we didn't forecast appropriately, so we didn't issue the yellow day advisory. We didn't issue any red days. One of the things we did when choosing our threshold values was look backwards. So if we had had the system in 2013, 2014, how many you know red days would we have issued? Um, and uh, in 2013, which was far and away the worst year, we would have issued probably uh, 10 red days in total clumped into a few different three-day events. So again, they, they tend to coincide with these multi-day cold air inversions. Um, and then another handful of, I don't know, five or six yellow advisories, which are kind of purely voluntary. 2014 would have had just one red day if we had had the program in place with a small handful of yellow advisories. So uh, hopefully that is helpful. All right. I have a follow-up. What, uh, do you have any statistics on illness from smoke? Yeah, um, so, yes, <laughs> trying to think where to start. So one of the challenges is, uh, and this is a challenge at, at community health in general, is the health issues that wood smoke causes like uh, um, lung cancer at its worst or asthma, you know, on the other, end of the spectrum. Wood smoke is not the only thing that contributes to those illnesses, so it becomes really hard to tease out exactly how much, uh, you know, how much wood smoke is contributing. Um, I have the EPA estimates with me. I don't have them memorized, but I'm happy to share them. The one number that has always stuck in my head, though, is they look at those um, health impacts and they can um, ascribe a monetary value based on the cost of care and the years of life lost to death or disability. Um, and they estimate that for every ton of uh, wood smoke particle pollution that's emitted, that results in about $360,000 in kind of health costs to society. Um, and, and so that's every one ton. And in Washington County, we see about 1,100 tons of wood smoke pollution every year. So you begin to get the kind of see the scale of the issue um, when looking at those numbers. But I'm happy to share the exact figures, too. Thank you. Spencer Ehrman, forum member. There's been a lot of talk in the news lately about um, industrial point source um, uh, pollution, Southeast Portland, um, Intel. Uh, there are a lot of mobile sources in terms of uh, uh, diesel equipment. Can you please speak to the, the hierarchy um, of uh, pollution sources um, and place wood in that hierarchy for <laughs> us? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. I think I know um, Spencer's familiar with a process that went on from about 2008 to 2011 that was convened by the Department of Environmental Quality to do just that, to look at all the types of air pollution we have in the Portland airshed and rank them. Um, what that, what that uh, process found was that wood smoke was, was number one. It was the top of the hierarchy, hierarchy, ar hierarchy. <laughs> um, but with any study, you can pick apart uh, all of the assumptions that went into it or the data inputs and things like that. 
um, one of the things we know since that study is that diesel, we're learning more and more every year about diesel pollution and, and how, um, how extensive it, Im, its impacts are to the community. Um, and, you know, for instance, um, if we had adopted the kind of what California considers to be the safe level of diesel pollution in that study, diesel would then jump wood smoke uh, to be the number one kind of health issue. So I, um, I still suspect wood smoke is pretty high because, um, because it's an area source, meaning that it's not one smokestack, it's, it's actually a million smokestacks all over the community with very little um, regulation or understanding of what's coming out of it. Um, and it's impacting uh, everyone at a kind of very local, local scale. So I'm not gonna give you a one, two, three answer. Um, I'm, I, I feel that the data is pretty strong that, that diesel and wood smoke are probably the top two, which one is number one, which number two. It probably doesn't matter because you address them very differently. Um, and I don't think that we should be limited in our thought to only addressing you know, one or the other. I think they're probably both good pursuits um, in trying to improve public health. So. Eric Squires, Executive Director. Matt, first, thank you. Excellent presentation. It was very insightful, a lot of great information. Um, second, I'd like to have you help me understand um, how this uh, enforcement is, is happening. When I look at uh, what you're talking about and the changes in Washington County, this is a, a largely a land use uh, template that's overlaid where new restrictions, <coughs> excuse me, that are not enforced by the counties, or excuse me, not enforced by the cities are now enforced by the counties. Um, and that uh, I'm wondering, how, can you tell me how these lines were drawn uh, for the new layers of enforcement? And yeah. with one quick um, uh, kind of note, uh, there's people who live on the edges. For example, I live on the, in the urban reserves that are uh, outside the urban growth boundary, and eventually that the property I live on or around will be developed. So I'm smothered in traffic uh, that's in, urban, or in rural Washington County. I'm surrounded by hazelnut farms that burn their trees, but now I have a new regulation that, uh, that I can't burn uh, the wood on, in open pits in the, uh, the 1.6 acres that I live on. And I find that really ironic that all of a sudden I have these new regulations that tell me how I can and can't manage the property I live on. So if you could uh, uh, talk a little bit about that, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, that's a great and big question. So I'll try to <laughs> walk through it. Um, I think, you know, one of the, um, well, I'll start by just talking about how we're allowed to regulate air quality in terms of wood burning, and that happens at the local level, meaning county or city government. Um, the Washington County Charter uh, does not allow for us to set policy within city boundaries on this type of issue, so we're not allowed to, to tell people in the city of Hillsborough what they can or can't burn. Um, we made a policy decision on the Washington County side um, in terms of backyard burning of yard debris to limit those rules to the urban parts of unincorporated uh, Washington County. Um, and we use the urban growth boundary as, the, as that boundary. Um, so folks outside of that UGB, there's, no, there's, there's nothing different you can burn like you always have been. Um, and and that, you know, we opted to use the urban growth boundary as our boundary rather than making one up because people are familiar with it and it's responsive um, to how urban, you know, it's mirroring how urban development does and or will grow. And again, we're kind of looking at limiting that type of activity where, the, where a lot of people live, which is in the urban areas. Um, the second question was about enforcement. Uh, so on the, on the wood stove and fireplace side of the issue, Enforcement is only an issue on those red days, and we haven't had any. <laughs> um, but when we do have one, it'll be complaint-driven, like all of our other code enforcement issues are handled, so they're all initiated by a complaint. Um, we'll reach out to the, the resident of the property, explain that we got a complaint about burning on this particular red day, um, and educate them about uh, what, uh, well, first see if they qualify as exempt, and if they do, we'll apologize and leave them alone. 
Um, if they don't, we'll talk to them about what the rules mean, how they can sign up to receive a red, red day alert. Um, we know this is all new, so a lot of people haven't heard the message yet. So I suspect we'll stay on that kind of education-based enforcement track for a while. Um, again, I can't speak to the city of Hillsboro, their, their approach, or the city of Cornelius, although I suspect it would be the same. Um, their code enforcement operations are complaint-driven, and I, in speaking with them, I, I hear kind of a commitment to keeping uh, an educational approach, I guess. Um, and then the issue of just kind of urban rural development, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head and that, that where those folks that are on the edges live in a dynamic area that's experiencing changes and development. Um, and I, I think that's just a, a policy making in a dynamic area like that is a, is a challenge generally speaking because things are constantly shifting and developing probably faster than our local rules are developed. And, yeah. <laughs> you bet. Even before I could ask for applause, look at that. Matt, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And as far as what's coming up, guys, April 5th, remember, April 5th, we have Congresswoman Elizabeth First in the evening doing a presentation that not only everyone here and at home on watching on YouTube will be interested in, but this is for a whole family. Involvement in politics, the value of it, and I keep saying to folks, if there's somebody out there who wants to know how to get elected, you may learn that too. Here next Monday, we have Lucy Baker, who is responsible for the Oregon Advo Advocacy Commissions, the commissions throughout the state. She'll be giving a wonderful presentation and helping us understand the different areas and how they work. And on the 28th, we have uh, Charlie Bertages, who is coming to tell me how to spell her, or how to pronounce her name properly, but she'll also be talking about the new bottle recycling stuff. And I, when she gets here, I will apologize for not figuring out in advance how to pronounce her name. Folks, thank you for being here on Monday. Thank you again, Matt, and we'll see you next week. Take good care.